Welcome to the RevOps Lab, a podcast exploring the art and science of revenue operations. To find more episodes and resources on scaling your revenue engine, visit getweflow.com slash RevOps. Hello and welcome to a special edition of the RevOps Lab podcast. Um, I'm here with Janus. Hello, Janus. Hey, how's it going? Yeah, good. I'm pretty excited because, uh, yeah, as mentioned, this is a special episode and we're going to talk about the results of the RevOps Salary Report 2023 that we created in cooperation together with the RevOps Co-op, um, the best and greatest revenue operations community in the world as of today. And uh, yeah, the last, <laughs> uh, which we also, by the way, uh, we are um, a partnership, uh, like we are, we're sponsoring them. So we're in, we're in a partnership with them. Very happy. Uh, it's a great community. You can learn a lot and if you're part of it, so definitely join. Um, and yeah, like the last couple of weeks in November, we spent um, collecting as much data as we can from our listeners, people on LinkedIn, we ran ads um, to make sure we get to a really high um, number of respondents in order to make sure that we have like a really meaningful report, which I think is always nice at the end of the year. And you're kind of like thinking back you know, what are my next steps in my career? How do I go into the end of the year um, review with my manager, uh, for example, right? And uh, having some of these stats handy is uh, extremely valuable. And um, so, yeah, that's what we try to do here. And that's what we want to share with you today. Let's go. Okay. Ah, yeah. Sorry. One more thing that I wanted to mention is, um, so if you are listening to this, that's fine. And we're going to describe all the numbers more or less that we see on the charts, but, um, definitely worth watching this. So this is uploaded to YouTube. Um, go check it out there. You can also go to getmeflow.com slash resources. Um, there will be a plot, uh, post about the report as well. You can also get the report from there and it will definitely also add that the, the video recording of the podcast also uh, on a website. So yeah, definitely check this out. There's a video. You don't have to look at our faces, just look at the charts that we're going to present. Good. Okay. Yeah. Um, so there's lots to talk about. Um, I think what we're basically going to do is we're going to go through a slightly shorter version uh, of the final report. The final report has like lots of extra stuff, like a special note from Yanis and me, special slide about uh, key takeaways, also a few slides about WeFlow how it works, uh, what it is. So we're going to skip that part and we're going to jump right into um, the gist of it. And um, yeah, just as a starting point, um, what is revenue operations? Um, who, what, who is the revenue operations manager? Uh, sort of like what is the market size and um, you know what's kind of like uh, the title structure there uh, in revenue operations as of today? Um, so for us, like the way we defined it is the revenue operations is a business methodology uh, with the goal to scale revenue creation and development by aligning uh, processes, people, and data across all the relevant functions and departments. And typically, um, I think as you all know, this customer success, sales, and marketing are the ones that stand out. But of course, depending on how your organization works, this can also include service, engineering, uh, product, IT other roles, um, obviously also working closely with the executive team, executive team on that. Um, but you know, this is sort of like how we were thinking about this, um, as, as part of this report. Um, yeah. And, um, I think just one more thing that is worth pointing out here in the beginning is that if you, if you, um, if you look on LinkedIn and you search for people with revenue operations in their title. Um, then right now you'll find around 17,000 individuals, um, who have revenue operations in their title or something similar to that. And, um, you know, this obviously feels like a quite small group if you compare it to the roughly 170,000 people on LinkedIn who work in sales operations or 82,000 people working in marketing operations. And then there's this, all this, this, this whole group of people who, um, who just call themselves operations manager. Um, so I think 
I think what's important to point out is that as part of this um, the, the survey, actually the majority of people who responded actually do carry revenue operations in their title. This was roughly roughly 72%. But of course, this was also relevant for people who work in sales ops, biz ops, um, and just operations. Um, and then there were also a few people who were sort of like in uh, adjacent roles um, who, who had something to do with that, even though their title did not um, effectively made that immediately clear when when you, when you looked at the title. Yeah. So that's just like a, something we want to point out. And, and I think it also makes sense because yeah, revenue operations is relatively new. Um, and um, I think, um, how was it, Yanis? This was the fastest growing um, uh, job job role in the last yeah. year? Yeah, on LinkedIn, I mean, that was the, the stat. And I think it speaks to the idea of, you know, breaking down the silos of marketing, sales, and success and having an end-to-end -end view on all things revenue. And I think related to that is that discussion around the chief revenue officer um, being really end-to-end -end responsible for all these three main topics. Um, I think RefOps relates to that very much. And yeah, it's good to see that we have 72% of people responding to this uh, re uh, survey um, coming from the, from the RefOps world. Yeah, yeah, really good. Really, really good. Um, yeah, uh, talking about participants. So um, in total, we achieved an end of 876. Actually, at this point, it's it's a bit bigger. We're still collecting responses, um, but they are not factored in into the, uh, the survey results here. And um, unsurprisingly, I have to say, seven, uh, US and Canada makes up probably 70% of all the responses with the US, of course, um, being the, the major player here. Um, while the uh, EU, and in the EU, in this case, we also include uh, Switzerland and Israel, forgive us, uh, but it just <laughs> makes sense as part of this report um, because, yeah, yeah, compensation, um, GDP, and so on, uh, culture also is quite similar. So, so, so it makes sense to include it there. Uh, UK, roughly 7%. And then, yeah, um, yeah. The rest kind of like grouped together, uh, seven point eight percent, and it's quite small. Um, so um, the rest, I mean, like Latin America, Southeast Asia, Australia, New Zealand, um, and then also uh, a few people from Kenya and South Africa responded. Um, that's great, and and we point some of these things out in the report. But uh, for some of the for some of the charts and the slicing and dicing of the data, the sample size there was just like too small. Um, to really fully focus on it because the yeah just the differences the deviation was was too big. So uh, the key focus I think is U.S., Canada, uh, Europe, including Switzerland and Israel, and then uh, the U.K. And then I think for the rest, yeah, I think we just need to you know do more surveys in the future and hopefully the sample size will increase with each survey. Good, um, yeah. Um, I already mentioned this, right? So uh, participants in North America and uh, the U.S. obviously a lot, a lot bigger. I think also a, a big role here is so. First of all, we did we did advertise the survey in RevOps Co-op um, as our community partner, and then we also ran ads on LinkedIn and we used our network on LinkedIn. We posted on LinkedIn about it. Um, so by default, you know, you have this natural bias. I think um, towards the U.S. It's just like one of the biggest markets in the world. Um, and um, it's also a bit faster, I think, uh, when it comes to the adoption of the RevOps role, um, uh, particularly in, in startups um, and late stage companies. So yeah, just, just by default, you will see more people with the RevOps um, title in the US than you will see in other countries in the world. So by default, the N uh, from participants in the US is just bigger than everywhere else. Yeah. Um, and um, that doesn't mean that um, uh, we don't have reliable results elsewhere. Right? So if you look at, for example, Europe, um, we also have a nice number of respondents from France, Germany, Denmark, Ireland, uh, Poland, Portugal, Spain, Switzerland. Right? And these are all like culturally quite close, even though it's like a huge continent. Some people might disagree with this now. Um, but I think <laughs> if you look at sort of like the 
Uh, of course, there's differences in culture, right? Uh, no question. Um, different but I think discussion. if you look at different discussion, <laughs> but I think if you just look at the business, the business side of things, right? Then um, I think it's fair. I think it's it's fair to make this comparison, and this is also why we included Israel um, in there. Uh, yeah. Okay. I think this is it about the um, participants. Shall we go into the Shall we go into the results? Let's do it. Okay. All right. The number that you've all been waiting for since you started listening to this. So the self-reported median total compensation of respondents in this survey is 120,000 US dollars. And um, so this is the median. Uh, we use the median um, because this is effectively just the, the standard um, KPI that you use, particularly for compensation. Right, average, you can easily skew the data if you have some extremes and particularly for, um, yeah, you know, if you have like a sample size of 100, roughly what we have for Canada, right, then um, you have somebody who reports, I know, 500,000 because they have like a huge stock bonus or something like this that would like drastically skew the data. So averages are not good. Um, median is a, is a much, much better way uh, to look at this. Um, and um, they already said something here like uh, stock, right? So uh, we look at the total annual compensation. So this is the base pay, but it also includes variable pay. Um, and um, so I think that's, that's also important uh, to understand. Not everybody has variable pay, but if you do have variable pay, obviously it's important that we include this um, in, in, the, in the calculations to make it comparable. Okay. Yeah, and um, uh, one more thing I wanted to mention on this slide is I think, you know, <laughs> speaking as a European myself, right? Um, I think if you sit in Europe, if you sit in Asia, Africa, African countries like Kenya, uh, South Africa, um, for example, then of course, like this number of 120,000, it I think it feels very, very, very high um, or it will feel very high to some, but uh, just keep in mind, right? So um, this is heavily... Uh, influenced by the large number of uh, respondents from the U.S. And the cost of living in the U.S. is also just a lot higher than compared to Europe, right? So your income needs to be higher. There's only a few countries in the world who actually get close um, to the median income in the U.S. Um, that's actually only at 31,000 uh, USD, just as a comparison, right? Um, so only like uh, Norway, uh, United um, Arab Emirates, and Switzerland have a comparable median income. Um, so you know, just just keep that in mind um, with like this 120k. Don't look like if you sit in Europe and 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 you make somewhere around like 80k, right? That's actually the median more in Europe. So don't feel bad if you listen to this and uh, uh, you basically make 40k less than uh, your colleagues in the US. They also have higher costs. Yeah, just just want to point that out. Exactly, that's exactly why we're also breaking down all these numbers by geo because uh, yeah, otherwise it's it's really meaningless to look at this, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. I remember I remember some discussions, um, you know, at, like uh, at a gaming company that I worked at like uh, many years ago, and I think there was like a report shared at some point on Slack with like how engineers are paid in the Silicon Valley. And of course, there was a huge discussion. Then. And our headquarter was in Berlin, Germany. And then, of course, there was a discussion around like, oh, you know, like, are we paid enough here? And is this fair? And so on. So, you know, I think these, these discussions often pop up. So I think it's really important to break it down by geo and really put yeah, that. I, I mean, ju just a little, uh, um, you know, insight here. I mean, obviously, uh, I think you had that experience at, you know, Vuga. I had the same experience at Fiverr, right? Like, um, and, uh, and I think there's like cost of living adjustments, right. And you can just look at that. You can Google it as uh, essentially global indexes of cost of living and comparison. And that's sometimes really helpful. Um, but let's, let's dive into the details and see, you know, how this breaks down by geo and by titles and all the fun stuff. Yeah. All right. Let's go. Okay, yeah, overview So the, for our listeners. So compensation by geography, it's like a long bar chart um, spanning from Indonesia, uh, which is at uh, 22K in median compensation, um, up to Singapore, which was at 176,000 
um, oh, sorry, sorry, 167,000 uh, US dollar in median compensation. Um, so it's a long range. Um, so all the countries from the different respondents are listed here, like um, South Africa, Malaysia, Colombia, India, Brazil, Germany, Spain, and so on. <clears throat> so, and um, I think, so we kept this slide in, but again, you know, just a word of warning, obviously sample size, you know, we showed it on the slides before, sample size in Germany, France, US, um, and so on. You, you can trust that. Um, and, and this will like really reflect the reality. But then if you go to Costa Rica, you go to Chile, you go to Lapia, right? That's, there's a high chance that this number, you know, cannot be fully trusted. It might be like a good indicator, um, uh, but just the sample size is too small to really take it for a face value. You know? So kept it in, but look at it with a, with a grain of salt. Um, but yeah, so what we did is then we grouped it by different geographies. And here, I think the data is already like a lot more trustworthy. So in the US and Canada, if you just look at that, median compensation is at 140K, then followed by the UK with 100K in median compensation, followed by Australia and New Zealand with roughly 90K, and then Europe with uh, a median compensation of 75K. And keep in mind, this includes Switzerland and Israel as well. Then we have Latin America with 50,000, um, Southeast Asia with 40, 44,000, and Kenya and South Africa, um, which we group just under Africa as a region, but disclaimer, right? Like just these two countries was a median compensation of roughly 25,000 US dollars. Right? So a very wide span. Yeah? Um, so uh, it really obviously matters what your cost of living are, um, uh, where you live. Yeah, so this is just by geography. I think it's interesting to look at, obviously, um, but um, I think it can be more meaningful um, if you slice and dice it even more. Um, so we also looked at it by industry, for example. Um, so here, actually, <laughs> obviously, like the largest share of people uh, who responded come from IT technologies, uh, software as a service. So this was obviously the biggest, the biggest group, and compensation there was also roughly the same, uh, 118,000 uh, US dollars, median compensation for revenue operations, people working in IT, uh, information technology, software, software as a service. And then another 10% of people who responded, they came from healthcare, hospitality, and media. Um, and interestingly there, like it was uh, a bit higher, uh, the median compensation. So in healthcare it was around 125,000 hospitality, surprisingly to me, um, to be honest, 140,000 140, and media was the highest, 160,000. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think- But just as a um, disclaimer, right? Just just as a disclaimer here, I think what's important is like, obviously, and you'll see that, that, you know, your experience and titles have a big impact on your, on your, on your pay. And so um, we obviously don't know how that's skewed in here. Um, so take this with a pinch of salt. I think what Philip alluded to, IT technologies, information, and software as a service, that's very trustworthy uh, data here. For sure, for sure. Um, and I think like, uh, I think one of the reasons why, why we kept this in is um, because I think it's just interesting to be aware of it, right? Like, I mean, I work in, I work in software, I work in, in SaaS. Um, so, so obviously this is like what I'm mostly thinking about. But there are these other industries and revenue operations also exists there, right? You, you do have revenue operations. Yeah, other there. industries than SaaS? What? <laughs> <laughs> I know, but I, I can leave you. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, sometimes I think, right? You kind of forget, right? Um, so <laughs> yeah, just keep that in mind. I don't know. Like, I definitely, I definitely have that. I definitely have that. Um, cool. Okay, let's, let's break it down a bit more. So now we're only looking at the U.S., and um, we're basically trying to understand um, how does compensation change by different departments. And the question that we asked here is, what department does your role report to? Mm -hmm. So, um, and um, so quite interestingly, just want to look at the distribution of respondents by department first. Uh, quite interestingly, 35% um, of respondents in the U.S. said they are reporting to revenue operations directly. So apparently for them, really revenue operations is its own department, which I think is great. I, I love this. 
Um, so um, I think, yeah, I think it just speaks to the role and how well it is established um, in the US already. Another 30% reported into sales, right? So this, um, yeah, roughly, roughly two thirds of people have responded that uh, revenue operations or sales and the rest is then more or less evenly distributed between finance, marketing, and operations. Um, and then we have a small share reporting, reporting to the exec executive team, to the founders, uh, even smaller share to customer success with only 1.3%. And then some people also report into product, uh, which um, to this point, I'm, I'm not really sure how that works. Um, <laughs> um, but we also kept that out of the, um, uh, the compensation um, reporting. Uh, we just wanted to leave it in there because I thought, yeah, interesting, interesting fact. Yeah, I think everybody's aware of the discussion about, you know, do you report into finance, the chief revenue officer, CFO, or CRO, or CEO, right? We even have, you know, some uh, podcast episodes about th this specific topic. And again, here, just remember, right, these are also folks with different titles again, right? So if you report into revenue operations, you might be in the revenue operations team as a uh, analyst or manager and re report into the VP. So that's also obviously also part of this. Um, and interestingly, if you look at, if you report into revenue operations, you earn less actually with, I think, a bit over 100K in the US. Um, uh, 140. Uh, 140. 140K. Um, yeah. um, 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 but, but that also means it's probably a reflection of um, where you are in the, in the organizational hierarchy. Yeah, that's a great point. That's a great point. Yeah. So if you report into the executive team of founders, then you're actually at 166K, right? But that probably also means that you are uh, more senior um, if you report directly to the executive team. And um, on the basically second position, if you want to call it that, is the finance team with a median total compensation of 160K. And the rest is all somewhere around 150,000 um, median compensation. So it's not a wide range, right? We're talking about like 140 to 160 K, um, depending on the department. Um, and then, yeah, if you factor in like years of experience, seniority and so on. Um, yeah, I think, I think it's interesting. Um, but it's, it's definitely not the main determining factor of, of your total compensation. Um, yeah, we did the same then for, um, Canada and, um, for the UK. Um, so here the uh, distribution is a bit um, different, um, particularly in Canada. Revenue operations actually um, is at 140K median, and the rest is below 100K. So sales, marketing operations, customer success, executive team, this is all um, slightly below 100K. And only revenue operations uh, earns more. But uh, again, I think this is a good example of just keep in mind, right? Sample size, Canada, roughly 90 people. Uh, majority in revenue operations. So the distribution on the other departments is just a lot smaller. Um, and with that sample size, the data is also more skewed. So I think you can trust, um, I think you can definitely trust the, the US numbers, but the Canada ones, I think the revenue operations number, you can more or less trust, but then I would be very careful with the other ones. Yeah. And similar is for the UK. Yeah? Um, and um, yeah, for those who are watching this, you can also see that uh, for example, in Canada, we also left out some of the roles. Um, um, so I think, uh, what is the one that we don't have in there? I think, yeah, in Canada, for example, we don't have the finance department even listed because the sample size was so small that we didn't feel comfortable even putting it there. Um, yeah, in Europe, um, um, also uh, just looking at compensation by department, distribution of respondents here, 45%. Responding, um, uh, reporting into revenue operations as a department, 18% uh, into sales, much higher share reporting to the executive team, to the founders, probably because more people also, I would assume, actually work in startups there in the revenue operations role. Um, and also a lot higher share reporting directly into operations departments, which is uh, apparently much more common in Europe still than it is in the US. Um, and then very few people reporting into finance, marketing, um, customer success, um, or product. Okay. I think let's move forward or. 
Ja, let's, let's move on. Ja, okay, gut. Ja, yeah, next up, we looked at compensation by company size. Um, and again, I just want to look at the distribution first. So first we looked at the US market and we asked the question of how many employees does your company have at the moment? And uh, so 42% said between 51 to 200 employees and 21% said between 201 and 500 employees. So again, right? So basically two thirds of the, of, the, of the respondents in the survey, more or less, um, you know, I think just from the number of employees, you can say, I mean, they work at, you know, mid-market companies, obviously, um, but you can also assume that like from the funding level, you know, like this is like a, you know, series C, uh, series D, uh, maybe also series B, um, stage of companies um, that we're talking about mostly and um, only few people so seven seven percent roughly um, are going more into the sort of like yeah still mid-market but going into enterprise with 1,000 to 5,000 employees and um, I think only um, three percent of the respondents in the U.S. worked at companies with more than 5,000 employees and so the revenue operations role at least in the people who were responded mostly like in this mid-market size. What I find really interesting here is that uh, for companies between 11 and then 1,000 people, that you really start making a jump once the companies are um, above 200. So uh, the earning potential in uh, Series C, D, E, F companies is a lot higher. I don't think that's so surprising but it's good to know, right? I think it's a good finding yeah. and it, it makes a lot of sense. Um, and and then, I mean, this reads a bit like the enterprise, you can make the most money. I would take that maybe with a grain of salt because I think the data is just too small here um, to, to really uh, be reliable. But I think the other part is, is quite reliable. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And I, I mean, exactly, I think it's a great point. Um, so you see, like for those who are listening, right? So. Uh, between one to 200 employees, median compensation in the US is 140,000. And then from 200 employees on, you basically go to 151,000, uh, then 100, roughly 60,000. And then if you're above 1,000 employees, you, you start going beyond 160, 165,000 uh, median compensation. And yeah, again, I, I would fully, totally agree, right? This is like probably like for the, um, especially like for more than 5,000 employees, just probably like the sample size is not big enough, but I think the trend already um, tells a nice story here. Yeah. Okay, yeah, um, we did the same then, again, broken down um, by Canada and by the UK. Um, yeah, it's it's not that clear cut there, uh, but I think this is due to the, due to the sample size. Um, so yeah, again, I would take that with, a bit with a grain of salt, um, check it out. Um, get get the report, look at the slides, look at the data there yourself. Um, and um, in in Europe, where I think we have a good sample size of 100, uh, 115 uh, respondents, there are also, you see the majority of respondents between 50 to 500 employees. So again, it's, it's again roughly two thirds of the respondents. So similar, really similar um, in the distribution uh, by company size. Uh, in Europe, um, compared to the compared to the US, um, and uh, but it's a bit of a different story in terms of uh, compensation. So their uh, compensation is very similar between one and ten employees and eleven and fifty employees. So there we are somewhere between sixty to sixty five thousand um, dollars in total compensation. And then we have this jump uh, once you uh, go above fifty employees. Um, up until 1,000 employees, somewhere basically total compensation of somewhere around 80,000. Um, and then we have another jump if you go more like enterprise, where we are then at 107,000 in total compensation. And then I would, like the, the 5,000 5, employee number is a bit smaller again, but I would uh, basically disregard that um, because it's just sample size is just not, not big enough there. Okay, um, good. Compensation by title. Um, here we ask like really like the simple question, what's your current title? 
And um, I think no big surprises there. Um, the higher your title, um, the higher is your compensation. That's basically the story. And this is true for all the different geographies. So <laughs> I think, yeah, I mean, this is just how it is, right? This is what you expect. Right? There's, uh, there, there, there's really, there's really no, no surprise here. Um, so as an IC in the US, um, your compensation is exactly at the median, 120,000. It's just the, the median also across the entire world, essentially, or the entire sample size that we collected. And then you basically have these jumps of like 15 to 20K, depending on the title. So manager makes more money. Obviously, senior manager makes more money. Director makes more money. Senior director makes more money again. And the vice president makes the most money. Um, we excluded uh, executives. Uh, C level from here because the the sample size there uh, was too small, so we didn't want to keep that in. Also, you have like very different compensation schemes on that level um, that do not necessarily make sense to compare with somebody who is an individual contributor or even a director. Uh, if you paid a lot in stock, right? Like then this is really just very hard to compare. Um, so that's something we kept out um, on purpose. Yeah, what I find that's really interesting is the jump from uh, kind of the, let's say, uh, director, senior director to vice president. I mean, that is a is a big jump, um, and uh, yeah, certainly something uh, I didn't expect to be that that drastic. Yeah, yeah. And for those listening, um, so that senior director makes a little bit less than two hundred k. In total compensation and vice president is at 250k so it's yeah definitely it's quite a big jump uh, definitely will have an impact on, on your life um, um, i would say uh, but also again um, heavily depends also on your seniority right and um, the the size of your company and so on so i think vice president you also have typically at companies um, you know that are a bit bigger um, and people who work as vice presidents also have a lot more years of experience, particularly in revenue operations um, roles. Um, where I don't, I've think, seen like, many startups e where everybody has a VP <laughs> title. So <laughs> I think title yeah, yeah. in startups is also a big thing. But yeah, I know what you mean. <laughs> yeah, that's true. It's true. It's joking. <laughs> but, but I think no. But I think it's a good point. I think hey, let's talk about this. I think it's a good point because um, I think you typically have this for roles that are more customer facing, right? Like that you have like a VP of sales, I think for different geos, don't you think that's more common than for like a more internal role, like uh, revenue operations? Yeah, hundred percent. I think, uh, I think just there's a funny episode about media agency titles. Uh, it's actually in German, but uh, yeah, like I think everybody's like a head of uh, lead uh, director um, and uh, for sure, right. To, to, to create that seniority. Uh, but to be fair, right, I think the uh, specialist uh, tracks, so um, um, what I think is in engineering more the principal path is also very common in, in, in sales. Um, and I mean, if you go from SME to mid-market to enterprise AE, uh, right, enterprise AEs can make a lot of money if they're really good at what they're doing, um, often even more than the zero. And I think rightly so, um, if you if you're able to you know win the big enterprises uh, and you do million dollar deals, uh, why shouldn't you earn accordingly? So I think it's um yeah it's um it's certainly a topic. But I think what's interesting here is that I mean how you make more money in RefOps is by taking more responsibility, managing a team, leading larger teams, and then having more responsibility. That's the way how you make more money here, right? I think the principal path is um, is maxed out. If you look at, uh, so we looked at basically conversation for individual contributors. What I think is really interesting is that, you know, if you have even 10 years experience in the US, you max out at around 120 to 140K, um, while, you know, the senior director and VPs go up to 200, 250K, right? And I think that's a really interesting learning. Uh, um, um, and maybe there, there there's uh, there's uh, unique uh, um, roles like you know being a really amazing Salesforce architect uh, on the more technical track, but um, yeah, not sure what else would there be. And I think that's basically what the t this this slide um, t tells us. Yeah. 
Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, like particularly, I see the individual contributor we wanted to, um, um, yeah, kind of like, um, uh, break down a bit more. So also looking at um, different years of experience for that specific role, um, because yeah, for sure there is this track to specialization. Um, so I think it's worth pointing that out. Uh, you can also make more money not by necessarily taking more responsibility, but also by just you know working longer at that role and specializing on it. Um, but yeah, I mean, the jumps definitely are bigger um, if you take up more responsibility in terms of management, the responsibility. Yeah. If you cannot hear Philip anymore, maybe he gets attacked by his cats, the cat jumping behind him. <laughs> so you just have to click forward. I'll continue from here. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. You saw the cat, I guess. I didn't yeah, see that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. cat was jumping in, but... All right, okay. Yeah, lots of cats here. Um, not that many. No, it sounds like a crazy cat person. <laughs> <laughs> it's just two. It's just two. <laughs> okay yeah and then um yeah next slide uh, we also looked at compensation by seniority again just focus on the us here and um, i think interesting right like basically within three to five years you can effectively double your income um obviously if the market dynamics allow it um so from going from up to one year to, to five years right you can basically make the jump from 75k to nearly uh, 150k so yeah it's a big it, i think it's it's pretty good, right? Um, I think it's good to hear, um, for, especially as a as a new starter, um, uh, as a postgraduate, essentially. And um, also, I think important to point out, roughly forty five percent of respondents have between those two and five years of relevant experience, thirty um, percent between six and ten years of experience, and then only thirteen percent of more than ten years of experience. And I mean that makes sense, right? I think if you would if you would do the same survey in for different job roles. Um, obviously, you would have a higher share of people yeah, with more than 10 years experience, like, I don't know, engineering, for example, just to stick with that. Um, um, it, because, yeah, obviously, the RevOps role is is a bit newer. And we also have people here, sales ops, marketing ops, uh, biz ops, and so on. Um, but um, revenue operations as a role, you know, it's just not that many people out there who have more than 10 years of experience. I think it just, just makes sense there. Um, um, yeah, uh, we did then the same for Canada. It's basically the same story, really. Um, the, the more like management responsibility you take up, um, the higher is your compensation. And then as an individual contributor, uh, you can make more money with more years of experience, but it flattens out, um, after five to six years. Uh, this is the same in Canada, um, obviously a little bit lower in total compensation there. So I see starting at 76 K. And then senior director going up to 220k. There is no VP um, here in this chart uh, for Canada because there are just not enough um, data, um, but reliable data up until the senior director. And then in in Europe, um, it's more or less the same story. Data is fluctuating a bit more there. So um, again, I see um, obviously the lowest total compensation, the median. Median wise with 65K, vice president goes up until 156,000. Um, and then, yeah, manager, um, senior manager, director, senior director, more or less a linear graph um, upwards. And there's just like a little bit of a dip from senior manager to director. People seem to make less money. But I think this is, um, I'm not so sure. I think in Europe, maybe the senior manager title is, is not so present. Um, I think it's more common that you have more people working with a director title. I'm not sure. Um, it's just a bit of fluctuation in the data. But then if you look at years of experience, then again, it's a very linear path. So um, you have a good chance to double your income more or less from one to six years of experience. And then it flattens out after after six years. So overall, yeah, I maybe. think same story. Maybe one more addition from my side. I think the ICs, uh, as an individual contributor, you max out at around 85K. Um, and uh, that's below the director title, right? So again, the same story, just on a lower, on a lower base. Yeah, yeah, great point. Great point. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So if you really want to get above 100K um, in Europe with a revenue operations role, Seems like you really have to take up that management responsibility. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, we did the same then for the UK. I, I don't think we're going to repeat the, the numbers uh, 
again, you know, go to capri.com slash resources. <laughs> no, 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 no. I think it's just it's just a lot, right? And I think for some of these, particularly breakdown by geo, um, go get the report, look at it. Um, it's the same story as in UK, Europe, and US. Um, uh, sorry, it's the same story in the UK as it is for Canada, the US, and Europe. So um, yeah, just go to getrefollow.com slash resources, download the report, enjoy the numbers. Um, yeah, good. Then we also asked um, just general across all geos, um, compensation by seniority, how many years of relevant reflex experience do you have? And then across Canada, Europe, UK, it's all the same story. Uh, right? More years of experience, more money. I think yeah, that's essentially uh, the gist of it. Um, I would say uh, Europe and UK relatively close um, in terms of total compensation. Um, bit of difference between four to seven years. So um, it's a bit higher in the UK than it is in, in, in Europe, um, but relatively similar. Um, and then in Canada, overall lower. So Canada tops out, uh, 10 plus years, tops out at 100K in total compensation versus uh, Europe is at 170K and uh, the UK is at 160K in total compensation. Again, this is for more than 10 years of experience. Um, so, um, yeah, I think um, you want to make more money, come to Europe or the UK <laughs> or go to the US. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But but live somewhere with a good cost of living. Yeah, 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 yeah. that's that's a tricky part, right? That's like, uh, if you want to optimize for that, there's a lot of things you have to optimize for. Because, I mean, like Berlin is also expensive. London is really expensive. Paris, really expensive. So, yeah, just make sure. Um, uh, you, you, you check that beforehand, if this is what motivates you. Um, good. I think, and also again, and this speaks just like, this is basically just a confirmation of the slides that we showed before. Uh, we asked whether people manage a team. Those who said yes, on average, as uh, like in median, made a higher, uh, higher total compensation. And so those who manage a team, median compensation, 183,000 in the US. Those who said no, 127,000. Um, so yeah, obviously, there's a big difference. And this is, again, uh, unsurprisingly, uh, and this was already shown in the charts before. Um, this is the same in Canada, Europe, and the UK. Managed respons management responsibility always means um, higher compensation. Okay, uh, this, is the, this is the breakdown that we did. So by geo, seniority, management responsibility, years of experience, department, um, this is essentially what we were able to do with the data. Um, hopefully in the future we can expand on this. Um, but we did ask a few more like questions without going so much in all the uh, details. And those were around educational budget, stock options, and remote work. Um, so a bit of like a bonus here at the end um, just to nicely um, close it off. Um, so on the educational side, we just asked whether the company reimburses or sponsors continuing education uh, once you stop working. Interesting, I thought it was like basically 50-50. 50% yes, 50% no, or like 51% yes, 49% no, if you want to round it. And um, then I don't think we have this here in the charts, but I remember it from like uh, slicing and dicing the data. Those who actually um, compensate and reimburse also have a higher median uh, compensation. Um, so I think it's just like company is just like more profitable. It's like the CFO is less strict about spending essentially, right? Less worry about cash flow. So um, I think this is just where it stems from. Um, then stock options, 52% uh, said they get stock. 70% um, get um, restrict restricted stock. Um, so uh, basically, a yeah, stock that needs to, to vest first. And um, 30% said um, they get nothing. So um, yeah, I think probably, you know, if you look at this by different company size, stage of the company, obviously, again, you know, uh, will vastly, vastly differ. Um, but I think also if you compare this with like other roles, um, probably the results would be very similar. Because I don't think like, stock, RSU, et cetera, has nothing to do with the RevOps role. Um, 
it just has something to do with like uh, the company, um, the stage of the company. Um, yeah, that's really that's really it. Still good to know. And um, and then the last one, remote work, and this one really surprised me. Um, I'm not sure how the numbers are for other uh, roles at the moment. Um, I think it's something you need to dive into a bit more. But 67% uh, of people said they work fully remote. And that's crazy to me. I mean, I mean, WeFlow is also a remote company, so maybe it shouldn't be so surprising. <laughs> but 67%, uh, that's a lot, right? Um, that's, uh, that's really a lot. And only 8% say they are fully in office. Um, maybe this is just because software as a service right, um, is, is, uh, plays such a big role or software and IT in general plays um, uh, such a big role or like revenue operations play such a big role in these, these types of industries. And they, those industries also naturally tend uh, towards uh, remote work. Um, but yeah, still um, crazy a high number. So if you like remote work, revenue operations, Probably good, good job to switch to. So s sounds to me like you are a VP of revenue operations in the US and you live somewhere with a good cost of living. That's how you optimize your earning potential. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's basically the summary and gist of it. Um, but no, I mean, uh, obviously, uh, not, not, all, not all about comp and, you know, finding something uh, you love doing and you know working with great people you can learn from is is equally important um but yeah from an earning perspective that's how you do it yeah yeah and i mean interestingly also again and here we pointed out also on the slides is the companies um that are fully or like those who work fully remotely actually on median also have higher compensation <laughs> that that's actually that's maybe even more crazy right like if you think about it those who go to office uh, median compensation um, 97,000, uh, those who work fully remotely, 130K. That's like, you know, $33,000 um, difference. And um, that's a huge difference. Um, yeah. So you have to go into the office, you have to pay for gas or a train or whatever your mode of transportation. It, um, so yeah, and, and your compensation is lower. Um, so yeah, Th very surprising. Yeah. Um, right. Quick summary, quick summary. Um, yeah, so I think I think in, in total, I think it's fair to say, you know, compensation for revenue operations generally follows the same patterns that you can find also in different um, jobs. So obviously years of experience, uh, management responsibility, those are key drivers. Where you live is a key driver. Um, and, and this is independent from revenue operations. Reven this is nothing to do with revenue operations. Um, and it's just like how it is in the world. Um, another key takeaway I think is uh, mainly helped by people working remotely. Just talked about it. Um, then thirdly, companies with 50 to 500 employees have the highest share of revenue operations professionals. Um, and uh, SMBs, large enterprises, they more still rely on these traditional roles outside of revenue operations. And I mean, that with that, I mean, uh, sales ops, marketing ops, just operations in general. Um, so yeah, obviously those companies that are high growth, series B, C, D, E, um, they also have, they are more likely to have revenue operations people working there. So I think, I think that just makes sense. Um, I think it's also what we see when we talk to customers, uh, with WeFlow and, um, yeah, there's some impact on, on who you report to. So CFO, CRO, those who report to the CFO, CRO have a bit of a higher earning potential. And again, unsurprisingly, IT software companies are the dominant industries for revenue operations professionals, but there are also opportunities outside uh, of those. So, you know, if you're like me and you tend to forget there's things outside of software development, then yeah, just, just remember that. Um, anything to add uh, from your side, Dennis? No, great. Um, brilliant, insightful. Cool, cool. Yeah, okay. So um, our last last slide, I think, is um, so if you want to optimize uh, your earnings, right, um, you need to have 10 years of experience. <laughs> you need to work remotely. You need to work in software IT. You need to live in the US. You need to be a vice president. And you need to work at a company between 200 and 500 employees. Then you can make 
definitely more than double of what um, the median income is that we put here in the survey. But to be fair, it's also just very few people. So, you know, don't feel bad about this. Um, this is just, I don't know, life, luck, different things coming together. And who knows if they are really happy. Um, so this should not be the determining factor um, on how you make decisions about your career development. Okay. Um, yeah, that's it. Um, if you have still questions, if you want to get the report and, you know, contact us, uh, we respond to every email or message that we get. We easy, to, easy to find on LinkedIn. And again, you know, go to getrefo.com slash resources. You'll find the report there. Um, go get it, share it with your peers and colleagues. Um, creating transparency in compensation is really important. Um, I think for fair pay. Um, so there are a lot of gaps that still need to be closed. And uh, hopefully this report has helped close some of these gaps, uh, knowledge gaps, um, that is, um, for you and your future career development and how you think about it. Great. Thanks, Philip. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much for listening to this episode of the RevOps Lab podcast. Please consider to like and subscribe our show and give us a five-star rating on wherever you're listening. If you have feedback or suggestions, let us know at podcast at getweflow.com. We read and reply to every email. Thank you. Thank you.